five minutes. Uh, and that will be when I'll come back on and ask questions that you have of our author. Um, and please do ask those questions in the Q&A box on, uh, on your Zoom. And, uh, and I will uh, go through those questions at the end of the program. Um, but uh, as I say, I'm gonna get off camera after I introduce both of our hosts uh, to, who are gonna be discussing uh, becoming abolitionists, um, police, protests, and the pursuit of freedom by Derricka Purnell. Derricka is a, a lawyer, a human rights lawyer and uh, writer, a columnist for The Guardian. And uh, she will be in conversation with another Harvard law grad uh, and Atlanta resident, uh, resident, Josie Duffy Rice, who's a journalist, lawyer, uh, an activist, and, um, and we are very honored to have both of them tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to them to uh, have this uh, very uh, timely conversation, and then I'll see you uh, at the end of the evening. Thanks again for joining. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you everybody for joining. I am um, Josie Duffy Rice, and I am so very excited. I'm trying to contain my excitement a little bit right now because I'm so excited to be here and be talking to Derica about this book, Becoming Abolitionist. I, I um, feel like we've I've been hearing about like the ideas in this book from her for so long, and it's amazing to see it in, in its full form. I have now read it twice. Um, and for anybody who hasn't read it, I highly recommend, um, I actually insist, I demand that you read it uh, because it is so worth your time, but I'm very um, happy to be here and excited to be in conversation with you, Derica. So thank you so much. Of course, of course. Thank you so much for reading it twice and make that <laughs> in with other people if we're doing this event i really wish that we were in atlanta in person together um although trey young is my least favorite thing about atlanta you are certainly my favorite and so i wish we should make sure that we do this again yes we will bring you to atlanta absolutely when we are world series champions which will be in just about a week oh, i can't even <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get into that we will get into that later uh but um, I wanted to start by um, talking about something that I love about this book, which is that so often when we talk about abolition or in the past, whatever, year and a half, uh, I think the same thing has happened in the defund conversation, we're, it's, a, it's a conversation on the defensive, right? It's a lot of like, we know what you're going to say, here are the answers to your questions. We, um, we are, we are um, apprehensive about how people are going to push back. And I think sometimes that can be limiting in the imagination. Uh, I think you do such an excellent job in this book of one of the first things that Derricka writes for those who haven't read it is she asks the, the reader to let go. Um, and she basically says, I take it to mean that she's, she's saying, take a second. I know that you have a lot of questions. I know that, that you might have these instincts of saying, but what about this? But what about that? Take a second and put that aside while you read this and allow your imagination to flourish. And it presents in a very different picture of what, um, of, of it, it presents a more, I think, just hopeful idea of what we're talking about. So can you talk a little bit about how you avoided being on the defensive and why you decided to frame the book this way? Wow, such a great specific question. It wasn't <laughs> initially intentional. I think that what I realize is by constantly being on the defensive for years talking about abolition, what I noticed is that the questions, I didn't have enough time always to answer the questions that people would ask me, right? And so I would, you know, be asked these questions about abolitionists in an organizing context with people who I would be in struggle with. And we took a lot of time to come up with answers, not just so that we could be comforted by answers. So what about this and what about that? but so that we also can organize towards them. And so I knew the conversations that I was having in, in like organizing spaces, but they felt very different than the conversations that I would have online quickly or with someone in passing or someone I just met who wanted basically me to distill all that I had learned in all of this organizing, all of this research, um, the history that I had come across, the sociology. They wanted me to distill all of that into 180 characters or well, they wanted me to distill all of that into 
a five minute conversation at a bar. It's like, well, I'm not going to tell you how we're going to get rid of police at a bar. Like that's just not going to happen or at a party. Right, or, right. You know, so I noticed that in my writing, I had a little bit more space, you know, 800 words here, a thousand words here to begin explaining much of what I have been pushed to learn and pushed to understand. And so with the book, what I asked and you know, the invitation, I think you described it perfectly. It's just like, hey, wait, wait, wait. I know you have all these questions, but it take, it's going to take years for some of these questions um, to get answered. And it's also going to take us asking better questions, more informed mm-hmm. questions, right? like more thoughtful questions. And so whatever questions that you're asking me about abolition, I guarantee you I've been asked by other people who are working towards abolition, who are trying to actually not only, like I said, find answers that make us feel good, but create answers, forge answers, because we're trying to build out um, the set of institutions for the society that we believe that we deserve. So I think taking a second and giving ourselves time to be open, to be curious, um, is the best way to absorb information. And so that's what I hope that people realize as they start picking up the book like oh yeah I didn't have all the answers like you know when I start the book when I was like five years old you know mm-hmm. even when I was in my 20s I didn't have all the answers and I, now I don't have all the answers I have questions too about abolition right. and so right. what I wanted people to understand is that this is not like a static position or identity or a brand right it's mm-hmm. a process where you're constantly asking questions of yourself and of others about what we deserve and then how we go get it yeah, I mean, I love um, what you say that you you kind of say this at the beginning of the book, and then you really repeat it throughout in a way that I think is really helpful, where you say, look, I'm, I'm this is not a how-to book, right? This is a book that asks questions and asks you to ask yourself these questions that you may not have thought of um, and presents some possibility, but it's not dictating to you how to do this, which I think is another great example of how to practice abolition, even in talking about abolition, right, that this is about um, allowing people to create their own future. So um, you uh, also went to law school. Uh, we did Fortunately, not yes. Uh, Fortunately, we had this experience. We, um, you also have worked in what, what the legal field calls like public interest law, which basically covers anything remotely related to, to public interest, which like prosecution is public interest law if you ask you know the law schools like all of these different jobs that I don't think many of us would consider public interest are in this field I say that to say that like anti-public interest jobs actually. anti-public interest jobs <laughs> you're just not you're just not making a gazillion dollars of doing yes. this job. um but I I I ask this because you uh you similar we had a similar experience where like after law school we did sort of legal related things and we have um straddled this space i think between um uh the law and not the law (laughs) and the various ways that that looks um and i wonder for you why a book felt like the the next move you've you kind of like approached this work from so many different angles what do do you think that a book um, what void did you think a book filled that some of these other angles didn't necessarily? Oh, that's another good question. Well, one thing I'll say is that I didn't anticipate writing this book when I wrote it at the time when I wrote it. I didn't, I didn't think that this would like, I don't, I didn't see writing a book as like a stage in like this long, hopefully life that I have, um, mm-hmm. especially this kind of a book. It's, it's, it, it's not something I expected to do. Um, and another sort of thing I think is really important to say is I've been a writer longer than I've been an organizer. I've been a writer longer than I've been a lawyer. Um, I've been writing since I was a kid, you know, stealing from my grandmother's journals, the, the, the back of the pages that were blank and when the other side was her poetry. So I've been writing literally my entire life. And so it's, um, you know, I think that one thing that writing allows me to do, which lawyering didn't allow me to do, is just to have a conversation about what was happening in the courts um, more publicly. And so on the one sense, I remember I was when I was working in Ferguson with the Ferguson Collaborative, and we were going to court around this consent decree, and we were fighting with the DOJ to get all these cases dismissed, these warrants that people had that were 10 years old. I'll just give you a quick example. We were trying to get one case dismissed Um, that was like 10 years old and it was a trespass case and the prosecutor there was just like well 
I'm not going to dismiss this case because there's a victim. And we were like, well, who is the victim? And the person, the prosecutor said McDonald's, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was just like, well, someone didn't leave a McDonald's 10 years ago and you're right. keeping a warrant open. So we were trying to get these cases dismissed and we weren't getting that much support from the DOJ, Obama's DOJ at that. Mm -hmm. And so when Donald Trump was elected, and I watched a public reaction and said, oh, no, we're going to lose the country. Here I was, you know, working in a consent decree scenario that was not like ideal. Right. And so being able to write about what I was learning, um, to write about how ineffective the courts are actually providing change, the kind of change that we deserve. Um, I think it just helped me to be in conversation with lots of people who aren't in the courtroom every single day. Mm -hmm. And so I think writing the book, you know, like I said before, it allowed, it just gave me more space. I don't know how many, 100,000 words in this book. So there's 80 mm -hmm. to 100,000 words in this book that can at least provide an offering, right? An additional text and additional resources to some of the organizations I've worked with, to some of the people I've learned from, from some of the scholars, some of the activists, you know, the United States and the broad is really um, just this a collective set of voices and ideas um, that's just so much more expansive typically than what the law allows. And mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, this book, I thought that I needed to go to do a PhD program and get all of the answers. Right. I and mean, I'm very grateful that I was discouraged from doing that, at least at this point in time, um, because I did want to write a book that we could use right now as an additional resource. And hopefully I've accomplished that. Yes, you absolutely have accomplished that. Um, I was actually going to ask you this question later, but I think it kind of um, stems from what you just said. And it's something I'm interested to see, hear what you think, because I think about this a lot. Um, for me, uh, law school, I felt like uh, really impacted my writing and not in, the, not in a good way. Uh, and it took, and I think it's still taking some time to recover from that, which leads to a bigger question, which is like, do you, how do you when you look back at your decision to go to law school are you happy with that decision do you think you made the right decision or the wrong one that's a very binary question to something other than binary I mean but I but I I do think um I do think it's relevant for people who like are trying to figure out what to do with the law uh and thinking outside of it but also knowing that like having some background in it is helpful yeah, so I absolutely loved law school. Absolutely. I know, I know, I know, I know. I, not I, know. That. I didn't, I really didn't see that coming. I, no one sees that coming. I absolutely love law school, but for very specific reasons. Mm -hmm. And so when I left Ferguson and drove to Cambridge, I was driving in the middle of a freedom movement. There was an uprising that was happening in Ferguson. There were uprisings that were kicking off in Baltimore and New York City, literally all over the country. There were student organizers who were, you know, at law school, at the college, and then there were community-based organizers in Cambridge and in Boston who were pushing, using the momentum from the uprising to push um, the institutions we belong to, you know, from schools to the city government, police departments, there were all these conversations that were happening about social change, not like cliche social change, make the world a better place, right. but conversations that were at, actually radicalizing and politicizing and making people ask questions that, um, that made them interrogate the kinds of people they wanted to be, the kinds of society they wanted to live in, the kinds of schools they wanted to attend. And so law school was an interesting three-year experience where when I think about it, I don't think about my torts class, right? No shade to my torts professor, but I don't think about my torts class. I don't think about, um, I do think about some very horrific classes that I've had. But when I think about law school, I think about the Belinda Hall student movement. Mm -hmm. I think about us supporting the dining workers and the janitorial workers. I think about the time where we created a space where anyone could teach a class and anyone could take the class. Mm -hmm. right? I think about the, the drums from the strike that the workers went on when we were out there and I was pregnant with Garvey and we were marching and saying, give, you know, give the workers health care. So mm -hmm. when I think of law school, I think of a very specific set of contexts. I think of a movement. I think of an uprising. I think of me going into law school 
wanting to be the next Michelle Obama, wanting mm-hmm. to be like, oh, I'm going to be an education civil rights lawyer. I'm going right. to be attorney general. I, I went into law school with these ideas of how to make change in a very specific way. And I graduated law school calling to question the very system that I had worked so hard um, mm-hmm. to, to be a part of, right? The system that I had try, I had spent the last 20 how was I went to law school, like 24, 25, 24. Mm-hmm. I spent the last 24 years trying to accomplish this dream. And mm-hmm. I exited asking, well, if, if I'm just another Black person in this system, does that actually reduce the amount of oppression that it perpetuates, right? Mm-hmm. And so I left asking better questions. I left with stronger relationships. I left with lifelong friendships in the United States mm-hmm. and abroad. It was the first time I traveled. And so that is what I think of when I think of law school. And everyone's yeah. not going to get that. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it's a really, so you, did you graduate in 2017? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were four years apart, um, but those four years were a huge four years. It was the summer after, it was when I was studying for the bar where um, the George Zimmerman verdict came down. It was, you know, like I I, I actually do think mm-hmm. in, in, large, in, in, in large part because of the movement building, but also because of Trump's election, all of these things that made people question institutions, like going to law school in that period must have been a much different and I think probably more fortifying um, experience because I feel like I'm still unlearning these ideas of like this as like these institutions as permanent and unmovable. Right. And I, I think that that's a different experience. Like it seems like you had a quite different experience in that way. Yeah, I know. Everyone is literally surprised when I say I love law school. I know. It's like the most, it's, your yeah. reaction was literally like, <laughs> I didn't take the same law school the one I went to is yeah. like, whoa. Well, yes, it's yes. Um, yeah, I'm great. I'm grateful for that time. I'm re- I'm going to remind everybody to um, put questions in the chat. Um, we are going to move to questions about 20 minutes or so. But um, uh, I just am throwing out that reminder. So use the Q&A function, please. Um, so one thing that I thought about the second time I went through your book that has really stuck with me is about power. So you have this... Um, I mean, haunting and and um, just very moving moment of a woman talking about how she was raped by a friend and mm-hmm. how she, and in her recounting of this moment, she talks about how she could see in his face that a lot, that he felt like he didn't have power um, and, and really a grasp on his life. He didn't have control. And this was a way of him kind of trying to retain and keep that that power, which made me think on second read just about how so much of what we're talking about is power, Mm -hmm. right? How so many of the systems that you articulate so well when we talk about patriarchy, when we talk about capitalism, I mean, when we talk about climate change um, are are about power and amassing power, which made me um, think about when you imagine an abolitionist future, how do you think an abolitionist future grapples with power differently? I know that was a big question, but. Huge question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's very big, but don't I- Don't apologize. But you were the person I had to ask. Yes, don't apologize. So I think it depends on what kinds of power, right? And so, and, and what, you know, the person in the book, what she's describing is a particular hegemonic power that comes from a place of oppression. And so sometimes when we talk about even people who cause harm, like very specific kinds of harms, the harms that many of us would just fear, like sexual violence, we often describe, we'll say something like, you know, rape is not about sex, it's about power. And it's usually about that person's power or control over the person that they're causing harm to. But what that sometimes obscure is that that person's um, usually often powerless position because of this institutional, um, the institutions that then have control of power over them. So she's saying that, well, you know, because this kid, you know, he grew up poor and white and he was grasping for a certain kind of patriarchal, you know, stance to position the world. He went to the military and the military said, boys like you don't survive here. You're too weak. You're, su- you're too soft. He watched a friend um, die by suicide. Mm-hmm. And then through a series of traumatic, further traumatizing events, he, you know, he had, he exited the military. And so she, she's recounting his experience and everyone should really get, um, 
this book is called Beyond Survival. It's, it's incredible, incredible abolitionist text that I don't hear people uplift enough. Please, 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 because that's where I first encountered the story. And I was just like, wow, it's mm-hmm. one of the few times I've actually read someone acknowledge the institutional powerlessness of people who cause harm. Right. Mm-hmm. It was very, it was very, very, very um, just awakening and moving. Mm-hmm. And so in what she's um yeah, so this person who's now has been socialized of what it means to be a man, what it be, means to be a white man, what it means to be able to dominate someone else. And now like they're failing at that, right? They're, they're failing at living up to what it means to be a white man in America. And then that violence, then what happens, it, it, it gets um, reproduced against someone who presumably has less physical power than they do, less social status than they do. And so that's like one specific kind of of power and then you know so for an abolitionist world the which is it's not like we're not an abolitionist world then right. we're right, 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 constantly right. forging right, 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 the right, right, kinds right. of abolitionist like futures that we des- deserve mm-hmm. which includes you know creating abolitionist habits and practices today like right now mm-hmm. and so if you're asking me, what does it look like once we eliminate the prison industrial complex, the carceral state, militarism? Well, I think I'm even asking, it doesn't even, we don't even have to be there, but I think I'm asking how either you, it, it can be an individual question or on a broader level, how you imagine society, you know, grappling with these questions, but how, how does either an abolitionist household community, you know, thought process, like how do we re- think about power differently? Yeah, so I think about power and justice similarly. I would hope that in the abolitionist community, a world where we're practicing these things and we're practicing them alongside these other paradigms, what binds us, what binds our family relationships, there's not a power dynamic that's exploitative, right? So how do we undermine exploitative relationships in our family? How do we undermine exploitative relationships in our community? And so much of that is shaped by patriarchy. So much of this is shaped by capitalism. You know, so much is shaped by, um, what's what's the song? What's the song? What's the song? I was just thinking about yesterday, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. So I, no, no, not Megan Thee Stallion. Not Megan Thee Stallion. This is just Cardi B. It's up. You know this song? If yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I love this song. This song That's is great. So I'd say this is a it good was song. a summer right. banger. Right. But then she has this line, right, where she says, broke boys don't deserve no kitty. Uh-huh. I know that's right. And so here we don't, this is like a power analysis right now. It's like, right. oh, if you're poor, then you don't deserve to have sex. Mm-hmm. So then how does that condition people right. who are not poor? Are they deserving right. of sex, right? And so right. Like, right. That's What's the power opposite? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so then it's like, well, that actually is conditioning, usually men, who are then poor, like, okay, I'm powerless. Now I'm going to take it. I, I, do, I do deserve it. So now I'm going to take it, right? Or rich man's like, well, I deserve it. I have money, right? And so it, I was like, oh no, like this power mm-hmm. dynamic is like off. We shouldn't say stuff like that, even right. though it's fun right. and I love the beat, but no, right. it's actually conditioned. Right. So in the world, I imagine you don't like get to have sex or pleasure or experience right. joy based on how much money you have or how much right. resources you have, right? Like right. that's a power dynamic that has to be undermined or at least reshaped, right? In the abolitionist future and mm-hmm. the family or the community that I want, people have agency, and they have dignity and they have the power to determine when to enter, you know, relationships, not only romantically, but also with their workplace, mm-hmm. right? What kinds of children do we want to have if you decide to have children? And so that power and that agency, that's what I would say that abolitionists are fighting for. Mm-hmm. And the more resources that we have, the more that we undermine patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy, the more agency that people are able to derive in making the decision, and then they're in control of their own sets of power. Mm-hmm. So that's a long way. Just oh, no, that's really talk I, about I, Cardi B. I think that's <laughs> exactly. I think that's exactly right. I and mean, I think, and to your point about the Cardi B, I mean, like what's interesting about that too is just how it both replicates these millennia-old concepts of power and it both feels boring and like um, out of step at the same time in a weird way, like pedantic. And, um, and, and I, I find myself feeling like that so often now in this kind of moment of change. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's actually just such a great example. Um, So when we were talking a few 
um, months ago about you writing, uh, you said something that, um, you said a couple of things that stuck with me, uh, but one of them was that writing this book has also was a learning process for you and, and like a, in our, in a, um, um, a distilling process for you of your kind of own outlook on abolition. Um, not, not the basics, not the basic, this is, you know, something I believe in, but like, you know, how you see people approaching it, um, the, the, the kind of values that undergird it, like this was a process for you as well. So the difference between how you started, where, where you were when you started this book and where you were when you finished it, can you tell um, us what that, what those differences were, like wh how, where you, what that, you know, how far you came and what that looked like? Yes, yes. Um, where, where do I even start with this? So the reasons why I thought I was an abolitionist when I first started writing the book were very different than the reasons mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. I saw myself. It's like having the time, space, and resources to get a lot of stuff out, including rereading some of the texts that I had studied before, revisiting conversations I had. I was like, oh, I actually think differently um, mm -hmm. about the set of um like the set of politics that made a lot of my current thinking possible. And mm -hmm. one of one, the biggest one was abolition democracy. Mm -hmm. It's something that I'm still grappling with. And so at the end of chapter four, it's, it's me working through that. So I had taken mm -hmm. this idea of abolition democracy, you know, via Angela Davis, W.B. Du Bois. Right. And I was like, oh yeah, that's what like we're sort of fighting for. We're fighting for um, the system as where everyone can sort of be included. Mm -hmm. And ironically, um, before I started writing the book, I read um, Fannie Lou Hamer's autobiography mm -hmm. and it shocked me. Mm. It really shocked me. It, she has the section, um, I think maybe in the middle, it's very, very short. Anyone can read it like in a relatively short amount of time if you have time and um, capacity. Mm -hmm. But she has this, this section where she's just like, if we're, oh, I just want to read it now. I'm so sorry. Do we have a time for me to Google this? Really oh, quick? please. I would love so to. Good. Now I'm so nervous. I'm not going to find it in time. No, it's fine. I'm, you should just see if you can find it because I think it'd be great to hear. Yeah, I just don't want to get it wrong. Right. I have things are zooming. It's so good she's talking about what it was like for her to grow up in Mississippi, what it was like to grow up as a, you know, as a sharecropper, how mm -hmm. she was punished for trying to register to vote. And then she has this idea of, um, of political participation and then sort of what it would take. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so bad. It's like literally 15 pages. Um, <laughs> it's, gonna make, it's gonna make me so mad if I, go, if I don't find this right now, but I might have to give up. If you, if you, um, do you find it, maybe we can send it to everybody who, if you find it later, maybe we can send it out. Oh, no, I know, but it's making me it. so oh. mad because it was just right here. So anyway, it, it just shocked me because when, when I am at least am used to hearing Fannie Lou Hamer um, invoke, it's towards participation, like, you know, voting, democratic mm -hmm. process, we have to do this, sick mm -hmm. and tired of being sick and tired. But she actually has this line in her autobiography where she talks about what it means to this to destroy this place um mm -hmm. she said you know what it i'm not gonna find this i'm now i'm just getting angry but she basically she said something like the reason that she believed in voting um and trying to fight for you know the the right to participate is because she believed in um what it means to destroy this place called america and I was so used to hearing her um, as someone who like wants to preserve this country and make sure everyone's included. But she says, you know, almost verbatim that I don't want equal rights to a white man because what that means is basically the power to destroy and to pillage. And so it made me think about this concept of abolition democracy as a project that we talk about as, as inclusion. Um, and then the more I read about abolition democracy, the more I studied W.B. Du Bois with other organizers, with Dream Defenders, with the People's Forum, I really saw Du Bois critiquing abolitionists. I saw him saying, wait, look at all of these abolitionists who were trying to do the right thing. They were fighting for Negro suffrage. They were trying to make sure Black people had dignity and work. 
And then he paused and began to critique them. And he mm-hmm. mostly critiqued their allegiance to capitalism, to Pennsylvania iron and steel. He said, you know, these were the shortcomings of these abolitionists who wanted so badly to end slavery. And as abolition entered into the um, public discourse, as it entered into public consciousness and became popular last year, I was watching people engage with abolition and not really talk about capitalism or decolonization or its relationship to feminism. And so it's, it's when I started writing the book, I didn't necessarily think to include like why it's important that we also think about these other paradigms of justice or fighting these other systems. Um, and I just thought I would be speaking to people who wanted to abolish the prison industrial complex or abolish prisons or abolish police. And then the more I thought about Fannie Lou Hamer, the more I studied the voice. Over time, I realized like, oh, it, it's indispensable. Like I have to talk about these other ideas. I have to talk about capitalism. I have to talk about disability justice. I have to talk about climate justice and environmental justice because I don't want our generations of of abolitionists to do what earlier generations of abolitionists did, which was fight to eliminate this institution, but we're on board with colonizing Hawaii and Alaska, who were on board with indigenous genocide, who were on board with capitalism and exploitating the Negro worker. I didn't want us to do that. And so I tried to write a book, like that is the thing that changed. Like once the book was finished and I looked at the earlier drafts, that's, sort of what was missing so the most Mm -hmm. of what I now like Mm -hmm. see myself thinking about how abolition is in conversation with all these other paradigms yeah I think a lot about how we tend to think of the the criminal legal system as like a limb that we can just cut off yes it's so good the rest of it you know is is not diseased right um as and it's not like this is and this the principles that define this system define the rest of them as well and so you know if like you can't actually narrow it down to this to this one thing and not talk about the rest um you brought up climate which um I'm glad you did because I think one of one of my favorite things about your book is that I I think that like at least in this general field I don't really like the idea of this just being in field and in silo but just for the uh, just for the time being, I'll use that term. There are other systems that we talk about in relation to, to the criminal legal one. For example, education, right? We talk about the school to prison pipeline. I think now more than ever, we talk about um, the, the, the child welfare system um, and its relationship to, to, to the criminal legal system. But we don't actually really talk about climate. Um, and we don't actually really talk about migration and space in the same way that I, I really thought um, how you talked about that was just so um, wonderful. I was hoping you would talk a little bit about the relationship as you picture it between climate justice, um, the you know abolition and and migration, I think in particular, uh, and what kind of made you include that. If you haven't read Erica's book, she has a great, um, she, she talks about climate justice both in when she imagines a new world and in, in, as she talks about like the source of the problem. And I think together it just paints an, a wonderful picture. So I wanted you to talk about that a little bit. Yes, yes, of course. Where do I even start? And so there is, there is like earlier points in my life where I saw the police respond to environmental devastation, right? And so when I was in high school and Hurricane Katrina happened, I remember the images of cops arresting people, threatening people who were looting. Um, and I was just was like, what? this like, this is what y'all are doing right now while people are in water that's, you know, four feet up their bodies while they're filling up the Superdome. Like this is the, this is the breaking news story. The very first viral moment I remember was Kanye West saying George Bush doesn't like black people, right? So this is, <laughs> it was right. Kanye was like, what, what can I say? Kanye was right. I missed the old Kanye. So, I know. That was a moment where I realized nobody at my school, I was, we didn't have a lot in common because we were all watching that in the common room. And I was like, and everybody was like, why would he say that? And I was like, okay, I'm in the wrong place. Cause it was my, it was like week two of college. Anyway, keep going. Yes, yes, yes. So I, so I remember seeing these sorts of, um, of moments. And then I remember um, when 
Standing Rock happened. I was also in law school. So much incredible resistance happened when I was in law school. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, watching these Native um, Indigenous people and their allies um, fight to stop this pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. And who, who, like, which side were the police on? Of course, they were on the side protecting the pipeline, right? Um, and then I was like, okay, like, what, wh why are the police always on this side? Like, they're arresting people who are protesting in Flint, trying to demand clean water. They're arresting, you know, people in hurricane, um, in New Orleans who are fleeing the rising tides of Hurricane Katrina. They are sh using water cannons to shoot at protesters who are trying to demand and protect water source, the clean water, trying to demand clean um, protection of their clean water source. Um, and then a couple of years ago, when I was working with Michelle Alexander, we were having conversations um, about climate. She recommended that I read this book called the Uninhabitable Earth. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the recommendation, I was just, I told her, I said, you know how people feel about abolition? When they're like, what about the murderers? What about the uh -huh. rights? And they're just like, I don't even want to deal with that. That was me and climate totally. change. I was yeah. like, all right, I know no. it's hot. You know, I'm not going to lie. Warm Octobers feel kind of good. I'm not <laughs> mad. I was like, I was just like, what? I really didn't have a robust analysis. I knew it was bad. I was like, okay, I'll just recycle. You know, I hate the paper straws. I'll just like, I'll like, just do it. Like, I'll just, mm -hmm. you know, change my habits. Um, so reading un The Uninhabitable Earth, he has his, Wallace Wells, he has his section where he talks about the relationship between heat um, and violence. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, you know, we know, that, we know that when there's heat waves, it triggers all of this violence in different parts of the world. And I was like, oh, wow, like that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to this NPR um, show about how in DC, there's up to a 10 degree difference um, in affluent neighborhoods and class exploited neighborhoods in the summertime. I was like, oh, wow. Well, mm -hmm. these neighborhoods are literally hotter, like literally hotter. Now, mm -hmm. like, remember, you know, my grandma, my mom, people in my neighborhood saying, you know, it's getting hot outside and that would automatically mean it's going to be violent. So mm -hmm. I just started reading, started, you know, talking to members of um, organizing groups who were working in climate change, trying to piece together these connections. And the more that I looked into the history of climate change and environmental degradation, the more I saw the police on the side of, um, of the oppressor, the more that I saw police manage the, the you know, climate migrants or people who were trying to escape, escape floods, who were leaving other countries. I mean, we often talk about that with war and militarism, but the police do a lot of that work domestically. And so it, it, it just made me so nervous as the climate continues to get hot, you know, if we reach four degrees, it's not just going to be a matter of our, of our planet. It's going to have all of these impacts on our body. And who's going to be there to arrest people is going to be the police. Mm -hmm. And so who, who's there to manage the climate um, the, the climate crises now is the police. When you look, even look at prisons, prisons are situated in places that are toxic. They're mm -hmm. vulnerable to all sorts of storms, right? So the, the relationship between the carceral state and climate change are just so, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, it's stark. They're stark. And so if we don't figure out how to fight for environmental justice, fight for earth justice, fight against climate change, what we're going to happen, what's going to happen is that we're going to continue to pour money to police and prisons to manage all of the ways that um, these problems are gonna manifest. And so we have to fight both of these issues at the same time, um, if we're, especially if we want people to be safe from all, all of the harm that's gonna manifest as a result of both. Yeah, absolutely. I'm making, I'm writing notes as you're talking. Um, oh, yeah. uh, so if you see me writing, that's why. Um, Frank, I know that um, we're going to go into Q&A, but I just wanted to ask Derica one more question um, before we do that, uh, which is about parenting. So you are one of my, um, my parenting heroes. I think you're Aww, just a great you. so um, mom. And I see the way that you parent your kids. And I, and I, you know, I have, my kids are one and four, Derrica's are seven and five. And I think that like, when we think about how to practice abolition, one of our main relationships and one of the ones that which we hold a lot of power, right, is parenting. Um, and so I wanted to ask you how you, how you um, parent 
um, how your parenting has changed because of your views on abolition, how you think about if, if maybe it hasn't and how you think about abolition in the context of parenting. And if you're comfortable, I mean, I, I'm interested in how that differs from your own experience growing up. You know, I, I feel like I'm parenting differently than my parents even though I think I have great parents, but generations change and matter. And, and so I'm just interested to hear kind of your, your own perspective on this very personal aspect of relationship building and establishing these values. Oh, thank you so much. That's so, so kind of you to share. Uh, my kids may not agree with you because I am <laughs> abandoning them and hoping that they don't- You're not abandoning them. Um, but no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, it will be easy for me to start actually with how my parenting differently. Mm -hmm. And so one major difference is that I have a Harvard Law degree. I went to college. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of resources. I have social networks. I have just so much that my mom just did not. You know, my mom was kicked out of high school at 14 years old, experienced so much violence, like from the education system, from family members. Um, you know, I mean, from employers, I mean, landlords, just repeated, 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 repeated exploitation and violence. Mm -hmm. And so I witnessed her as a child constantly mitigate, you know, the violence that she was experiencing and try to protect us and then also be angry at us, try to cope with it through various unhealthy, ha unhealthy habits. And so navigating all of that right and trying to raise six children you know while being a single mother while being black while living in um the the downtown part of, of south st louis i mean it's just 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 terrible just i have no idea um people look at me and say how do you get through harvard law school with you know two right. kids and i'm like how did my mom get through right. south st louis with six right it's, so it's right the kind of strength that my mom um you know, like had to, had to pull it together in order to make it work. My grandmother too was mm -hmm. basically her co-parent. I was raised between both of their homes. And so, and again, similar, you know, mm -hmm. also raised six kids, you know, in St. Louis during a time of, you know, just stark segregation and white supremacy, white supremacist violence and racism, misogyny, all of that. And so I think about that and I feel actually quite lucky um, that both of them pushed me, you know, really, really pushed me um, and fought for me and advocated for me to like stay through school, through high school, through college, and ultimately through law school. And so that's one big difference, right? It's not just my particular mm -hmm. parenting style is that right. I have a different set of circumstances than my mom and then my grandmother and even my great grandmother who I've, I've known she, until she passed when I was 22 years old, she was nearly 100. So that right. all is very different. Right. Um, and then there's like, you know, silly stuff like one time I was on the phone with my mom and she heard me ask Juice what do you want for breakfast and she was like you ask your kids what they want for breakfast <laughs> you let them get away with anything I was like oh my gosh and I'm like really like are you serious right. um, um and so I think that being a parent has challenged my politics more than anything in the world and you see that in the book more than anything. You can use all the right pronouns. You can say all the right things on Twitter. You can, you know, go to court and make all the right art, um, arguments. You can say all the politically like charged things you learn from reading Fanon, right? And like your movement meetings. At the end of the day, you have to decide if you're going to gender your child. Mm -hmm. You have to explain to your child, like, especially my kid, Juice has been obsessed with God's gender, right? And he's trying to make sense of which team God is on. Is he masculine? Is he feminine, right? Like he, so I, I have to make sense of how he's being conditioned around patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I have to have conversations with him about poverty, right? The other day he said, I know we're not poor and I know we're not rich. I know we're not poor because we have things that we need. Like we can get new toys, we can get new clothes. And I know that we're not rich because we don't steal from people. And I was like, yes, that is the spirit. Yes, Juice. Yes, child. And so I have to figure out like how to raise a person who right. doesn't put someone's poverty like it doesn't blame them for that as an individual, mm -hmm. right? And so that takes time, that takes care, that takes intentionality. And I fumble at it, but I try really, really hard because mm -hmm. in addition to like fighting all of this systemic oppression, in addition to defunding the police, in addition to, you know, trying to fight for sweeping policy changes at the state federal level, in addition to our international solidarity, we also have to do the hard work of raising people 
who like care, like who can see the world differently, who can try to move in the world differently. And so I am still learning what it means. You know, my babies are, are quite young and, you know, I'll see if it works. We'll find out in like it's 10 years. So far. Yeah, but <laughs> I think find out so. about 10 years, but like everything else, you know, it's a journey and I try to get feedback from them when I'm, when I get it wrong, you know, mm-hmm. when I'm too harsh, when I, when I get reactionary and I default to carceral logic, I default to policing logic because I, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Just go sit down. You know, mm-hmm. that's, and, and then Ju says, well, that's not very nice, mommy. Well, how about we say it like this, right? right. So it takes time to, to undo what we default to. Um, but I think the time is ultimately worth it. Yeah, I think that's, I, I love that. Um, and I also would just say, you know, we're human. Uh, and so those moments are also natural and real. Those, I mean, I hope uh, <laughs> of feeling, you know, like these, these are the relationships that test you the most and yes. that you to have. So I'm going to um, pass it to Frank. I am, I've literally been looking forward to doing this for like six months. I uh, am so grateful um, to you for, uh, for joining and having me. And I am really excited to bring you to Atlanta in the spring because we are going to do that. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm excited to see you. Um, I know you're coming about random things. So many other things. Okay. Uh, Frank, I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I, uh, as sorry as I am that uh, our good friend Tony Clark could not be uh, here tonight, I am grateful that uh, it, it meant that I could be. So this was a great conversation and uh, all of uh, the folks out there and it's been a great audience and I don't think we've, in fact, we usually watch to see our people dropping off. We've been gaining audience as we've been on. So you, you, you two were wonderful. Um, I, I think uh, Michelle Alexander's uh, description on the back of the book this book is essential reading. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I just want to mention, if you order your copy from us at acapellabook.com, uh, Annika has been kind enough to sign book plates. So you'll have an autographed copy, even though she is not yet able to visit Atlanta. But uh, like you, Josie, I look forward to her being here uh, maybe sometime uh, in, in the new year. Um, so the, the first question, and I, I'll uh, mention, you know, I wasn't expecting to be here. Um, I am not able to see the questions as they're coming in. So Josie, I might not give you the rest of the night off. You might have to field That's some okay, of these. That's okay, I'm here. Great, I, yeah. I pulled a couple of off before, uh, oh. and, and now I see that I can't see what's coming in. Um, okay. the, uh, the, the first one um, for you, Danica, was, um, w- was from a professional legal, in the professional legal space. Uh, what are the, the challenges that you have in, in being taken seriously when you're uh, working toward uh, and voicing your uh, thoughts on abolitionists, are there, do you see that struggle to be taken seriously in the professional legal space? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I would say that early on, right when I graduated law school, I thought that I was going to hit the ground running as some sort of um, abolitionists trying to evangel- evangelize all of the lawyers, like, look, this is what we need to do. And then that came to a screeching halt, um, mostly because so much of what, and Josie, I would love your take on this too, so much of what happens in the public interest sector is really controlled by funding, um, the philanthropy sector. And so if you are trying to apply for a grant and you're trying to do abolitionist work, but you have a funder who wants to do criminal justice or reform, then often that controls the, the tides of what kind of work we're able to get done. And so it's so, so important for lawyers, I, anyone, but I will also say lawyers who are in public interest spaces, who are trying to lawyer with abolitionist politics to continue to push and continue to organize and, you know, find someone else. I get I don't, I don't want to call anyone out, <laughs> but last year I got emails from lawyers at ACLU, at LDF, all of these big, really, really credible shops who said, I'm afraid to talk about abolition at my job, mm-hmm. right? I'm afraid to talk about abolition at my job because I'm not going to be taken seriously, yet we're getting so much funded to do policing work. 
And so we need lawyers to push in those spaces, push in spaces um, to try to shift the kind of work that you're able to do. And so I, it was very hard doing that, especially as a new lawyer um, where I worked and I was very lucky to have a level of flexibility um, and a level of curiosity at the organization where I worked, which is the Advancement Project. And so when I was go on sites, I would try to talk to community members and figure out if there is a way for us to do political education together, for us to read together and study together about abolition, and then think about how can we do this campaign in an abolitionist way? Mm -hmm. And that's where we found alignment in our work. And that's what we tried to do. It's like, well, you know, I don't know if it's best that we keep trying to diversify the Ferguson Police Department. You're not ready to say abolish the Ferguson Police Department, but we both agree on dismissing these cases. Right. So let's figure out how we can put pressure on the police department to dismiss these cases. Or we both agree that we should um, revise the use of force policy for the Ferguson Police Department, because then they'll, they should presumably, I guess, have less ways to hurt people with force. And so finding the overlap where you can do non-reformance reforms, like reforms that limit the power of these carceral institutions to do harm, um, if you can't do abolitionist um, lawyering but i think it's important to continue to push because the more people push the more seriously it may be taken i think that yeah it, uh, a, a similar question but outside of the legal world just uh what do you find is the best way to talk to people who are disgusted by the current criminal uh system but they still just can't get their heads around abolition I think it depends. I think it depends. And so there are people who ask me about abolition and they don't care about my answer. They don't, they ask me what about the murderers and they literally don't care what I have to say. I could literally have a specific example for every single homicide scenario. And they just aren't interested because they're interested rather in being antagonistic to what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who ask, what about violence right you know the policing is bad they don't feel safe they don't feel safe in their neighbors they don't feel safe in their lovers and it's just like they actually want to be safe and i don't think it's helpful to tell them to not ask those questions i think if anything is an opportunity to learn more about what what they feel unsafe for and to then think about different ways to respond to their immediate safety concerns and their long-term safety concerns and so for example when i was just working on the closer workhouse campaign with actually st louis part of our strategy was well if we want to close a jail in one of the cities that has one of the highest homicide rates in the country. And we have to convince people that this is a worthy pursuit. We have to convince people who are afraid of being, you know, victims of violence that this is a worthy pursuit. Well, what's one immediate response to that as well? How about we also invest in street violence interrupting programs? How about we also invest in community mediation and other resources to attend to this direct concern that people have right now? So we can do that, but we have to be willing to listen and to affirm the real fears of people who are scared of violence, who are afraid of violence, right? We shouldn't dismiss violence. We shouldn't downplay it. We should acknowledge when the media overplays it especially which is what has happened in the last few weeks with the um, the spike in murder rates, but we should not like shy away from also finding solutions to their immediate, their immediate concerns. And so I find the best tradition of, of abolitionist organizing does that, whether that's in Salud Salud in Puerto Rico or the Freedom Community Center now in North St. Louis, or oh, so much work that's happened with Anti-Police Terror um, Project in, in LA and Oakland. So there's so many organizations I'll talk about in the book who take that concern seriously and also try to figure out how to move forward with an abolitionist ethic and organizing um, strategy to make sure we're meeting people's needs and we're reducing the cost of the state. But thank you so much for that question. Great, great question and answer. The, the next question is gonna be be mine because um, I, I was, as, as you know, I, I was supposed to be somewhere else tonight and that somewhere else was uh, at an event supporting a candidate for secretary of state here in Georgia overseeing the election. So I'm curious, I know that defund the police, any talk of abolition, it's just, it's very difficult in the political sphere for uh, candidates to talk about that. So what do you see as the relationship between votes for a more progressive 
candidate uh, and, and your cause of abolition? Also a great question. Right now, when we talk about the abolitionist movement in the 17, 1800s, and we talk about the civil rights movement or the long civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, we talk about them quite romantically. We assume that during those moments that the fights were evenly polarized, that you had a whole army behind Martin Luther King fighting for civil rights, and then you had a bunch of bull Connors who were resisting these people, right? And it's actually not true. Civil rights discourse is very unpopular. To say that you were fighting for civil rights in the 1960s was just, I mean, it was so undermined that the federal government, you know, they launched an entire you know, surveillance campaign to undermine civil rights activism. But now when we celebrate Martin Luther King on January 20th and we plant our flowers and we recall the speech and we honor him on April 4th, it's as if that history of resistance to civil rights is just not worth discussing. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that in thinking about electoral strategy for candidates who are trying to figure out how do I get elected, but how do I stay away from a topic that's politically polarizing? I hope they learn from organizers who are trying to make sure that polarization is not only bad, but we actually can use polarization if we're in deep relationship with communities and we explain what we mean when we say abolish the police, when we say what we mean when we say defund the police, and we have the will and the commitment to be responsive to showing ways that that can happen. And so if a candidate is only being responsive to the rhetoric and not committed to doing the deep community relationship building around what it means, then I think that they're in a losing position anyway, or they're in a losing position anyway. Um, I really, I have a ton of respect for Representative Cori Bush, not just because she's from St. Louis, even though I love that she's from St. Louis, but I think that she doesn't shy away from very politically polarizing topics because she knows in 50 years from now, 100 years from now, she's going to be on the right side of history, mm -hmm. right? She's going to be on the right side of history. And mm -hmm. she's doing the work by being in conversation with her constituents. She's explaining to them what we mean when we say defund the police, why she's fighting for sweeping policy changes, how it connects to inc mass incarceration. So candidates who do that work are in office, right? She won. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it, we have to figure out how to appreciate the candidates who are doing that and use them as a model and instead of running away from particular fights that are worth fighting for because of optics, right? We have to be the people who make progress happen. And we can't run away from progress simply because of a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, Josie, I, like I said, I, I can't see any of the more, okay. any other questions that have come in. If you can, I'm gonna let but you uh, take them and more? then we'll probably wrap up in just a couple. Yeah, I'll do one more, more yeah. because I know we're at, we're at eight o'clock, but um, um, uh, there are a couple that I think are really great. So, um, Derek, there's a question here about capitalism. Do you feel that capitalism can be reimagined away from the categorization of groups of people for the purposes of exploiting, excluding, and extracting labor towards the profit of another group, towards a more just resource allocation system and just society, which I take to mean whoever wrote this is... Um, is understands more than I do, but I take this to mean: is there a is there a future of capitalism that does not exploit? Um, and and can you imagine what that looks like, or is that not on the table in your head? So I see capitalism as a stage of our economic system, mm -hmm. right? And hope we are currently fighting for the end of that stage of our economic system because as long as we have capitalism, I think that it we're going to have a system that you know, continues to rely on exploitation of mm -hmm. workers for the profit of the people who own the means of production. And so I am not committed to maintaining that system. I am committed and eager to figuring out how to transition to the a next stage, our next stage, a more just stage of an economic system. And so it's, it's, funny you were talking to me about what sorts of system, uh, what, where have I changed with abolition? And so right now, 
Um, I'm mostly thinking about what does it mean for us to move towards a more socialist society, right? And why are the people historically who are excited about moving towards a socialist society, including people like Dr. Martin Luther King, why were they assassinated? Why, like, why would their popularity, you know, why would their popularity drop at such a crucial time when they say we should build an economy where people share, <laughs> <laughs> right, where people can, you know, um, derive benefits, where we have a government that functions and take care of people. And so I'm interested in what it's going to take to build and transition more towards that. So I don't see a better reformed, you know, version of capitalism as the goal. I do see us trying to figure out how can we reduce our exploitation over time to get to a more socialistic society. And what may happen along the way is that we transition from the, the kind of capitalism we have today to a different kind of capitalism, but that's not the goal. That's not ultimately the goal that I'm fighting for. Um, what I am fighting for is a completely different society that's, play, that's um, based on the next set of, um, the next kind of economic system that we should have. Right. So some people are fighting for anarchy. I think anarchy, anarchy is a legitimate like fight that people should actually study. And again, not default to public rhetoric or what it means. But I'm interested in what a more socialist society will look like. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. OK, so we're uh, we are a couple minutes over and I'm going to get just I just want to end on this question and then um, we can shut it down. But um, uh, so Miriam Kaba says hope is a discipline, as you know. Baldwin says hope is created every day. How do you remain hopeful in this work and how do you sustain yourself in this fight to create a better world? This was asked by Brandon Chapman. What gives me hope? <laughs> I mean, I, everything you're saying. He digs Twitter gives me hope. Okay. He gives me, I told you that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. You didn't take me I up. know, and I did not take you up on it. It's true. You did not take me up on it. Okay. How do I sustain myself in this fight to create a better world? I, I have to say, I think that this is an extremely hopeful book. I found this book really hopeful. Did you did you feel that when you were writing it? Yes, absolutely. 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 And I think what gave me a lot of hope th through this book was that people took like their hopefulness, took their imagination, and they combined it with will and commitment. Mm -hmm. That's what gives me hope. That in the face of all of this oppression, all of the white supremacy, all of the capitalism, all of the exploitation, all of the homophobia, that people are still daring to imagine and they're still experimenting with ways to resist that violence. And in, in many cases are winning, right? Are winning, are creating new language, creating new ideas, creating new identities, new organizations, new policies to fight for. I think that's something to be extremely hopeful about. Um, and so that, to know that I'm in that tradition, right? I'm an inheritor of that larger tradition of people who like literally made a way out of no way, made several ways out of no way. I think that's hopeful um, to know that oppression doesn't always have the last word. And I would, I also would hope that if the people who are fighting for the kind of world that we have now chose to fight for it without knowing whether they would win, but chose to fight anyway, that is what I'm attracted to. That's what makes me hopeful. So yeah, it's, are we going to have the courage today to fight for something we may not witness, we may not experience, and that I organize with, I know I witnessed so many people saying yes to that anyway, that brings me incredible hope. Mm. Thank you so much, Derica, um, for this conversation, which I said earlier online, every single time I talk to you, I feel like I learn a gazillion things from my favorite person to talk to about this. And um, tonight is no different. So uh, if you have not read her book, I cannot recommend it enough. I've read it twice and I have two banshee children at my house, which means if I have found time to read something twice, y'all all need to at least read it once. Um, I have bought copies for every day. No, there's a book. You see it in the back um, with Frank. It's it is really truly incredible, um, and it's and it reads beautifully. It reads like uh, it's not it's not um, you know I'm not a, always a big nonfiction person, but this is just a beautifully written book. So thank you so much for writing it. Thank you so much for talking um, to me, and thank you so much to Acapella and the Carter Center for having us. Of course. Thank you so much. Tonight was incredible. I'm excited to see you in the spring. I know. I can't wait. Thank, Thank you. So you. This was a, a wonderful conversation. I sure enjoyed spending this time with you.
And thanks to all of you out there for uh, joining in. And we hope to see you again uh, at our next uh, acapella virtual event. Uh, go to acapellabooks.com to see what's coming up next. And don't forget to order your copy of Becoming Abolitionist, signed by Derek Purnell. Good night. Good night. Bye.